Over the last several decades, scientists and engineers have helped change our world in ways imagined only by a few. If we consider humanity's rise to space as starting with Gagarin in 1961, then we are 60 years into this endeavor. How have we progressed? In 60 years, less than 600 people have reached Earth orbit, and only 24 human beings have left the orbit of the Earth, with 12 having walked on the moon. Next year, 2022, on December 14th, will mark one half century since any human walked on the moon. On that date in 1972, Captain Eugene Cernan drove a lunar rover out and set up a camera to record the liftoff of Apollo 17 from the surface of the moon. These are his actual words, restored with noise reduction, as recorded on Earth. Bob, this is Gene, and I'm on the surface. And as I take man's last step from the surface back home for some time to come, but we believe not too long into the future. I'd like to just let what I believe history will record that America's challenge of today has forged man's destiny of tomorrow. And as we leave the moon and Taurus literal, we leave as we came, and God willing, as we shall return with peace and hope for all mankind. Godspeed to crew of Apollo 17. Captain Cernan had no idea when he left the moon that almost all of the space projects developed before his landing and all of these that were planned after would go unfunded. That for 50 years after Apollo 17 departed the moon, there would be no human presence outside low Earth orbit. But in hindsight, after a half century of disappointment, it should be clear to space enthusiasts that if humanity is to have a chance to live permanently off the Earth, it will have to come in coordination with visionaries and commercial enterprise. Hello and thanks for listening. Welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and help us out on Patreon if you can. We also have academy theme gear available. There are links for these in the description. It can cost billions of dollars to develop a new space launch system, making access to space, for right now, the sport of billionaires. Since the dawn of the space age, spaceflight has been for the extraordinarily gifted and lucky. This may soon change. Several companies stand out for trying to commercialize space and make it available to at least the well-off citizens of a developed nation. These companies are SpaceX, led by Elon Musk, who dreams of colonizing Mars, but may be offering tourist trips around the moon. Blue Origin, led by Jeff Bezos, who wants to colonize the moon and build orbital habitats and send tourists above the Van Karman line. And finally, Virgin Galactic, led by Richard Branson, who wants to use a rocket plane to give people a chance to experience space. We haven't talked as much about Virgin Galactic in our lessons. That's because we are most often talking about orbital space operations and space colonization, as these are critical to humanity having more than one home in the solar system. But we can't neglect the psychological aspect of space travel. Almost everyone who has traveled to space remarks upon how it changed their perspective. The ability to see the Earth as it truly is, undivided by artificial boundaries or politics. They often seem to become less provincial, less nationalistic, and more reflective, with increased awareness of environmental concerns. Most humans would love to have access to this experience, but even if you are highly trained and healthy, there are so many vying for so few opportunities that your chances of winning the lottery are higher. As I write this, there are Oleg Novitsky of Russia, Mark Van de Hey of the United States, Pyotr Dubrov of Russia, Thomas Pasquet of France, 
Megan MacArthur of the United States, Shane Kimbrough of the United States, and Akihiko Hoshide of Japan. Seven human beings out of over seven billion, from four countries out of 195. If any of us are going to have a chance at going to space, we have to democratize space travel. SpaceX will offer trips to the ISS and later around the moon, but this will cost the traveler over $50 million. Blue Origin is planning to send people up on their new Shepard rocket system. The new Shepard is a small suborbital single stage rocket. The rocket has flown 15 times with 14 successful flights. It has never flown with a human being, but this is planned as early as 20 July, 2021. The seat is being auctioned off and the current high bidder is at $2,800,000, if you're interested. If you are, please help us on Patreon, because you have too much money. Later, Blue Origin plans to have prices competitive with their competition. Their only real competition in recreational spaceflight right now is Virgin Galactic. Virgin Galactic was founded by Sir Richard Branson. Sir Richard is, of course, a billionaire. Mr. Branson was born in 1950 in Blackheath, London, England. He started a magazine called Student at the age of 16 and founded his first company in 1970 as Virgin Records. Virgin Records was a mail-order record company, which became a chain of Virgin megastores. In the 1980s, he helped found the Virgin Atlantic Airline. This company brought him a lot of financial success and worldwide recognition. In 2003, a small rocket plane, built by the brilliant aerospace engineers Dick and Bert Rutan, won the Ansari X Prize by being the first privately developed spacecraft to fly to space. The design of Spaceship One and Two are not entirely new concepts. The X-15 was flown to high altitudes by a B-52 bomber, then dropped when it would fire its engine and go into space. This proof of concept made the design of Spaceship One less risky. The pilot, Mike Melville, became the world's first commercial astronaut. Some people may think that adventurers like Tito and Lance Bass are the first commercial astronauts, but they are not. Mr. Bass, as with every other astronaut who has flown to the ISS, had to pass several months of NASA and Russian training certification. Mr. Melville walked out on a tarmac, climbed into his rocket plane, and went to space. The Spaceship One design is quite different from Blue Origin's New Shepard. Most rockets are trying to make it to orbit. They turn parallel to the ground as soon as possible to try to acquire enough horizontal velocity for a stable orbit. New Shepard, on the other hand, tries to go almost straight up, cross into space, and then come directly back down. Spaceship One flies a path the opposite of an orbital rocket. It starts off horizontal, carried to high altitude by a jet-powered carrier plane. This can be considered the first stage, and upon release turns vertical, flying above the Van Karman line and rotating its wings to present its widest surface to the airflow as it re-enters the atmosphere. Once it is slow enough, the wings are rotated back and the ship glides to a landing. Spaceship One flew into space twice within two weeks and can hold a crew of three, meeting the X-Prize criteria. Seeing this seems to have inspired Mr. Branson. He had been an adventurer, climbing mountains and flying high-altitude balloons around the world, but he had dreamed of experiencing space flight and wanted to make it more available. Mr. Branson purchased the Spaceship One technology and hired Rutan's company, Scaled Composites, to build two white night carrier aircraft and five Spaceship Two space planes. Let's look at the technology behind these designs. First, Spaceship One. Spaceship One was designed to carry three humans from an altitude of 15 kilometers to above 100 kilometers, come back into the atmosphere, and land on a runway. Spaceship One is made mainly of graphite epoxy. It is 8.4 meters long with a diameter of 1.52 meters, has a wingspan of 5 meters and a cord of 3 meters. There are two long tail booms at the end of each wing. These bend up 70 degrees on re-entry. The dry mass of the ship is 1,200 kilograms. The gross mass is 3,600 kilograms, of which 2,700 kilograms is the rocket motor, with the empty rocket motor casing having a mass of 300 kilograms, giving a propellant mass of 2,400 kilograms. The rocket engine is a unique hybrid version, and here's what it looks like. At this end is a liquid oxidizer tank holding nitrous oxide.
This part is a solid hydroxyterminated polybutadiene or HTPB motor with four hollow cores. On ignition, gaseous oxidizer is sent through the core to burn the fuel at high temperatures. The rocket engine was designed by SpaceDev, which is a part of Sierra Nevada. The engine generates 88 kilonewtons of thrust and can burn for 87 seconds. The oxidizer tank is a structural component of the engine and is the only part of the engine connected as an integral part of the fuselage, and it is cantilevered, meaning attached on only one end and suspended. The tank is a short cylinder, 1.52 meters long with domed ends. It is made of a composite liner with graphite epoxy overwrap made by scaled composites and titanium interface flanges. Flanges are flat collars or ribs that attach a usually round object to a rail or something else. Here are some examples of flanges. The oxidizer tank is filled to a pressure of 4.8 megapascals at room temperature. The fuel casing is connected to the tank and is continuous as a single component to form a patented case, throat, and nozzle, or CT in design. The engine uses a lot of composite materials also, including the overwrap, as you see here, which is made by Thiokol. There is a high temperature composite insulator to block heat transfer made in-house. The solid fuel and ablative nozzle are integrated into one structure to minimize the possibility of leaks. This entire section is called the CTN. The CTN is bolted together with the oxidizer tank at the main valve bulkhead. There are O-rings at the interface to prevent leaks. Mounted on the main valve bulkhead inside the tank are the ignition system, main control valve, and injector, all made by Space Death. The tank has slosh baffles also mounted on the bulkhead. The oxidizer is pressure fed and no pump is needed. The ablative nozzle has an expansion ratio of 25 to 1 and is made by AAE Aerospace. The CTN is replaced with each flight. Everything else on the ship is reusable. The engine cannot be throttled, though it can be turned off. The thrust drops during the flight because the pressure in the oxidizer tank starts to drop with operation. At the end of the flight, some liquid will go from the tank into the engine and burn faster, increasing thrust. Spaceship One was carried to an altitude of 15 kilometers by a plane called White Knight. White Knight is itself an incredible work of engineering. It has twin J85 GE5 turbojets with afterburner, raised at 15.6 kilonewtons each. It has the same cabin and controls as Spaceship One, so it can be used as a training craft. It has a wingspan of 25 meters with long, thin wings in a W shape. White Knight carries Spaceship One to altitude, where it is dropped and then the engine fired to carry it into orbit. This had all been accomplished with Spaceship One before Richard Branson bought all the technology and started scaled composites construction of Spaceship Two. Spaceship Two, as you can see in these images, is much larger than Spaceship One. A larger space plane needs a larger carrier aircraft. Here you can see the size differences between White Knight, that carried Spaceship One, and Mothership, or White Knight Two, that carries Spaceship Two. Spaceship Two has a length of 18 meters. This comparison shows the dimensions in feet. Just multiply by 12 and divide by 40 to get meters. The cabin is about the size of a business jet and can carry six passengers and two crew. Spaceship Two will have an apogee of 110 kilometers, well above the Van Karman line. The passengers will pay to be launched up into a parabolic trajectory, during which time they will experience freefall. Spaceship Two is powered by Rocket Motor Two, which is very similar to the technology that powered Spaceship One. All of this engine is made in-house by scaled composites. The larger Rocket Motor Two produces 310 kilonewtons of thrust with a specific impulse of 250 seconds and a total burn time of 60 seconds. In 2007, a flow test was being conducted where the oxidizer tank was filled with 4,500 kilograms of nitrous oxide, followed by a 15-second cold injector test. There was no intended ignition, but the nitrous oxide spontaneously exploded, killing three employees and injuring three more, two critically. After an investigation, work on the motor continued, and it was hot-fired and well-tested by 2009. Glide tests with the vehicle were performed in 2009 through 2011. In 2012, the VSS Enterprise was completed and Rocket Motor 2 was installed. In 2013, the Enterprise was carried to 14,000 meters and deployed. 
The motor fired for 16 seconds and control was stable. The ship went supersonic, reaching a velocity of Mach 1.2. Virgin Galactic then tested using a type of nylon as fuel. And additional tanks were added to the ship, one for methane and one for helium, to help ensure a proper burn of the larger engine. On Halloween Day 2014, VSS Enterprise was carried to altitude and deployed with pilot Peter Siebold and co-pilot Michael Alsbury. The engine fired and the ship was about to go supersonic when the co-pilot released the feathering mechanism, allowing the tail booms to start their swing. Being transonic is dangerous for any aircraft. Some surfaces of the ship will be subsonic and others supersonic. The booms were whipped back and torn from the spacecraft, causing the ship to break apart. Both men were knocked unconscious as the ship came apart around them. The pilot came to and deployed his parachute. The co-pilot did not and impacted the ground at terminal velocity. The NTSB completed an investigation and found that the crash resulted from pilot error and poor safeguards. After this tragedy, Virgin Galactic completed construction of VSS Unity. They had decided to go back to the HTPB-fueled engine, though the FAA determined the new engine had nothing to do with the accident. Glide tests were started in 2016 and powered flight in 2018, with a successful space flight on 13 December 2018. Everything has gone well since, with Unity reaching Mach 3 in February of 2019. This flight had David McKay as pilot and Mike Masucci as co-pilot, with a passenger Beth Moses. They crossed the U.S. definition of space at 90 kilometers, but not the international standard of 100 kilometers. This made Moses, by U.S. definition, the first woman aboard a commercial spacecraft. Moses unsnapped her seatbelt and experienced freefall. This flight did cause a large crack in the fuselage that had to be repaired. Virgin Galactic then moved to Spaceport America in New Mexico in February of 2020. In December 2020, a computer connection error caused Unity to have an ignition failure, at which time it glided back to the runway to safely land. Both the crack and the misfire are regrettable, but prove the design is inherently tolerant of failure. Improvements were made, and the first Spaceship 3, the VSS Imagine, was unveiled in March of 2021. The VSS Inspire will be coming soon. Sometimes we are asked which company, Blue Origin or Virgin Galactic, is a threat to SpaceX. The comparison is ludicrous. While Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic will compete for the suborbital purse market, and both have NASA contracts to fly experiments and astronauts to freefall, SpaceX has been flying payload to orbit and relanding the boosters for seven years now. They are regularly flying astronauts to the ISS. The other two companies have flown no one and nothing to orbit. It is possible that Blue Origin might work out the problems with the BE-4 engine and get its orbital new Glenn on track, putting them only a decade or so behind SpaceX. And Virgin Galactic has been working on getting small satellites to orbit also. They have put their experience with Spaceship 1 and 2 toward developing an air launch rocket system. The design of White Knight and White Knight 2 as carrier aircraft creates a great opportunity to fly a good-sized rocket to high altitude and launch a small payload into orbit. The benefit to an air launch system is that it can take off from almost any major runway on Earth and deploy satellites to a variety of orbital inclinations. This alone will not make Virgin Galactic a SpaceX competitor, but it will definitely make them a Blue Origin competitor. But they better hurry. If the past is any measure of success, SpaceX will soon be launching 100 tons to orbit with a relatively cheap, fully reusable Starship. A flight on a Virgin Galactic spaceship, from runway takeoff with White Knight 2 to the totally awesome drop, the launch to space with six minutes of freefall, and return for landing, will last about two and a half hours. In contrast, the Blue Origin New Shepard flight will take six passengers and last 11 minutes from launch to landing, with several minutes of freefall time. If we had a quarter of a million dollars to spend on a space experience, I know which one I would choose. But Virgin Galactic has other plans too. In 2016, Virgin Galactic announced a collaboration with Boom Technology to develop a supersonic transoceanic passenger liner, like the one you see here. This might be a hybrid plane that uses conventional engines to get to altitude, then fires a rocket to complete a suborbital trajectory. This could compete directly with SpaceX's plan for suborbital transportation flights and fit in much better with current airlines infrastructure. There is no reason why this could not be a successful business. Just as there is no reason why Mr. Bezos could not improve the performance of his company and get New Glenn off the ground, competing directly with SpaceX. The question is, will they? Thanks for listening. 
Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Help us out on Patreon if you can and stay safe. At Astro Proterra.